a look through this prism may just shake. For some students, the news coming out of the University of California at Irvine might just be vindication. Recent research indicates that caffeine may just enhance one's memory. So for all those who thought that the drug might have only been good for pulling an all-nighter, or those worried about its addictive qualities, well, there's just one more reason why coffee addicts or chocolate connoisseurs can smile. Joining us to talk about cognition and caffeine is Michael Yassa. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at the University of California at Irvine. Welcome, Dr. Yassa. Thank you for having me. So when we're talking about the impact of caffeine on memory and behavior, this isn't necessarily a medical prescription to take caffeine. It's just a study at overall potential effects? That's correct. So there, there's nothing uh, medical about it at all. In fact, this is regular caffeine that you can get uh, through any means. The way that we did it was just using tablets, but there are many, many different ways to ingest the same amount of caffeine. Now, I have to admit, and I probably shouldn't, but the statute of limitations are probably over. But when I was in graduate school, I was in a experiment uh, as a laboratory worker in which we were using various doses of caffeine to look at the different affects that subjects would have given to audio stimuli, cries, shouts, laughter, screams of horror, things of that sort. And there were a number of experimenters, myself, of course, excluded, who, when it came to finals times, would take that raw caffeine and we would use it to help us in our studying. Not that we should do that, not that anyone should do that, but are you saying it might have had a dual effect? It's quite possible, and it really depends on uh, the timing of it all. So as long as it, it didn't interfere with sleep schedule, so, you know, you mentioned earlier on uh, pulling an all-nighter. And, of course, having caffeine uh, help you pull an all-nighter is going to reverse some of the uh, positive effects that you have on memory because sleep is very important for memory. Uh, so uh, drinking it by day, having it uh, help you sort of focus better, be more alert, uh, during studying, certainly uh, our study suggests that even having it right after uh, is helpful because it helps you strengthen the memories of the things that you just learned. Uh, that all seems to have positive effects, but having it sacrifice sleep and reduce sleep quality, I think, could get dangerously in the, uh, in the territory where it's really having negative effects on memory rather than positive. Now, is it really stimulating memory centers or is it doing the opposite? Is it just making you more alert so that you have more time to memorize? Yeah, so that, that's another great question. And, and, and uh, the short answer is yes and yes. So it, it really, we think it does both. The reason that we did our study is that we tried to actually pull those two alternatives apart. All of the past work that had been done has really not been able to pull apart the effect of caffeine, whether it's on alertness or attention or whether it's actually on memory. And the only way to be able to deconvolve those two variables that often go hand in hand is to administer caffeine after the study has actually occurred. So even though it might have helped uh, with attention and alertness, we exclude that because that's not when we give it. We actually allow people to study the material first, and then we give them the caffeine pill or a placebo. And then we wait 24 hours and test their memory. And when we do that, even though we've excluded the effect of alertness and attention and all of these things, we see that there's an effect uh, directly on their memory as well. Now, did you find that there was a difference in the effect for, let's say, coffee addicts and people who might prefer juice? Uh, yeah, so that, that's another great question. The study actually was conducted in individuals who were, by definition, caffeine naive. And what that means is that their weekly intake of caffeine was under 500 milligrams per week. That was the stipulation that we set for ourselves just based on the literature. What we found was actually uh, most of the people, if not all, in the study, their intake was lower than 70 milligrams a week. So they were really not caffeine uh, or coffee drinkers at all. Uh, they were generally people who didn't drink coffee or tea or anything anything like that. Um, whether or not the effect will be different for those who are regular consumers of caffeine, I, we wouldn't be able to speak to that just because we didn't do that experiment. But my guess is that you probably require more to be able to get that boost. And that was actually going to be my next area of inquiry, which is, were you looking at caffeine as a drug that would have a short-term benefit or one that has long-term? It's possible that this caffeine may have effects for a short period of time, but 
if used over a long time, the effect that you were looking for disappears? That's entirely a possibility. I will tell you that one really other, in, uh, other interesting bit of information about this, uh, and this is not from our study, this is from other labs and other data, there is a suggestion uh, that's come about recently that caffeine is associated with healthy longevity with a decreased risk for Alzheimer's disease. And now we're talking about habitual use of caffeine over a period of many, many years, maybe even decades. Um, so there's some data that suggests that maybe long-term caffeine use isn't so bad, although our data doesn't speak to that because it was very, very short-term use, just over 24 hours. And I'm guessing what they're talking about is long-term caffeine use in moderate levels, right? Absolutely, yes. These are all in moderate amounts, yes. So tell me again about the population that you studied. Who are these, they? These were uh, individuals that were uh, undergraduate students mostly um, from the Johns Hopkins undergraduate community where the study was actually performed. We only recently moved to the University of California, Irvine, uh, but, the, but the study was conducted at Johns Hopkins. And uh, like I said, they were not habitual uh, drinkers of coffee or tea. They um, uh, did not report any sleep disturbances. They, this wasn't right around final exam time, so it wasn't a hugely stressful period of time for them or anything like like that. We tried to exclude as many of the other variables uh, as possible, so we made sure that they all were uh, very, very similar in terms of the number of hours of sleep they got and, and, and so on. And what type of memory tasks were you performing? We performed several, but the key one that we were interested in, in, in looking at the effect of caffeine on uh, was a task of memory discrimination. And the way that works is that when we bring them in the first day, we actually don't tell them this is a memory test at all. We just show them pictures of everyday items on a computer screen and have them look at those pictures and tell us for each picture if it's an indoor or an outdoor item. Now, in reality, we don't care much whether it's an indoor or an outdoor item. We just want them to pay attention to the screen. After about 200 of these stimuli, we give them either caffeine or placebo, and we send them home. Then they come back 24 hours later, and there we give them a test, also a computerized test, where they see some of the same items they saw the day before, some completely new items, and some items that were similar but not identical to the ones they saw the day before. And this is a test of memory discrimination. What that means is that on the items that are very similar, they have to be able to tell us that this is a similar but not an identical item to the one they saw the day before. So it involves having a very detailed memory of the exact item they saw the day before. For example, I could have showed them a picture of a coffee mug the day before, and then the next day I showed them a picture of the same coffee mug but just rotated slightly or a slightly different color coffee mug. And they have to be able to tell me that that is not the same one they saw the day before. That's a very difficult kind of discrimination. And what we found was that those who were on caffeine were actually better at making that discrimination than those who were on placebo. And you only used one specific dose of caffeine? We started out that way, and then we did a dose-ranging study where we actually uh, bracketed that dose. So we started out with placebo versus 200 milligrams, and then we did another experiment where we included 0, 100, 200 milligrams, and 300 milligrams. What we found was at 100 milligrams, we didn't get the boost uh, that we got at 200. At 200, we replicated our findings, and at 300, we didn't get any additional boost over the 200, but we started to get subjects reporting some uh, side effects like jitteriness and headache. And, and nausea. So there might be a ceiling effect when it comes to caffeine. It's quite possible, yeah. Or even an inverted uh, U-shaped curve, which is very, very typical for these agents. There's a window uh, of uh, optimal sort of dosage, and then anything beyond that, you might start to get nasty side effects and might actually do more harm than good. Now, one thing I was initially thinking when you were describing the experiment was that you might have a validity threat in that if you put me into a room and you show me a whole bunch of images, I might figure out what you're doing. I may think, oh, wait a minute. I may need to really pay attention to these images. But then again, that threat may not be as powerful if the control and the experimental group are doing the same task anyway, because you have an equal likelihood that your experimental or your non-experimental would make that conclusion. That's a very, very uh, accurate remark, absolutely. So even though there may be a little bit of that threat, um, it, it's not going to, one might not suspect that it would affect the experimental or the control groups differently. And because they were completely randomized and we didn't know who was getting caffeine or placebo and they didn't know either, uh, it's still within, within the realm of experimental control. Now, I guess I should ask the Shakespearean question, you know, a rose by any other name. Is memory by a different name different? In other words, are there different kinds of memory? Does this only work, as far as we know, towards this one type of visual memory? 
Yeah, that's a great point. Um, of course, you know, the, the answer, to be, to be completely honest, is we don't know because we only did it using one experiment and one type of memory. Um, but we don't suspect that different memories operate differently, to be completely honest with you. Most of the literature suggests that whether it's visual or auditory, uh, that memory is represented really more holistically, more abstractly than anything else. And so I, I would suspect that if we'd had a verbal task, for example, that we would probably get very similar results. Now, in the experiment I described earlier that I conducted, giving you a hint of my age, uh, we used grease pencils, uh, tape measures, and EEGs. Uh -huh. You were going a little bit more modern. How were you looking <laughs> at people's brains? So even though it wasn't part of this study in particular, we actually use imaging. We use MRI scanners. And, and these scanners are, are just a, a magnificent uh, invention. They allow us to use small magnetic perturbations of the brain to be able to look at um, the function of different pieces of tissue, different parts of the brain, because we, we make the assumption that different parts of the brain that are engaged in a task are going to require more blood flow to them. And we can track that blood flow. We can track the movement of that blood flow. We can see where it's going and what networks are being activated, and in some cases, how they communicate with one another. So this, this imaging technology allows us to do that with a, a great degree of detail, and the technology is getting better and better every day. And when were you imaging the students? Was it after they took the dose, when they came back, oh, the very yeah. stages? So that part of the study is the part that we're conducting right now. That's not one of the, the published findings yet. So the, our, our follow-up is to be able to image them during the encoding process and also during the retrieval to see if there's a differential effect of caffeine. But, but we'll have to stay tuned for those results. Now, at this point, would you be confident to say that there's a causal relationship, or are we still talking about associations? <laughs> Um, at this point, it's very difficult to say that it's causal. Uh, I think that it is an association, of course. Now, this is a, a directed manipulation, so we did give caffeine versus placebo. It's one of the stronger pieces of evidence that's used to infer causality, but to be able to draw that exact arrow is always very difficult for us scientists. So it's one experiment. I think we need to do many, many more, and hopefully with uh, you know, maybe a dozen more experiments like that, we can really infer causality. Did you find any disparities between intragroups, between uh, genders, between races, et cetera? We have not, but I don't think our studies were really powered to be able to do that because every time we try to look at a variable like that, we have to have enough representation in each group. Uh, and that breaks down our sample size and makes it much more difficult experimentally unless we had a much larger sample. So we couldn't do it in this preliminary experiment, but I think that is something that we should look at in the future. I can tell you that there are differences in metabolism of caffeine. There's definitely a gender difference. There's even a difference within women uh, with whether or not they're on hormonal contraceptives. So if they are on the contraceptives, the, there's evidence to suggest that their metabolism of caffeine takes about four to six hours longer. So there's all sorts of differences like that. That suggests that caffeine might stay in their system for longer. Probably the most important question, how many cups of coffee have you had today? I'm on my fourth. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if I should have divulged that information. <laughs> and the final question, similarly related, any chance your research is funded by Starbucks? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Not at all. We, do, we don't take any funding from any uh, association that uh, sells coffee or anything like that. All of our research is actually funded by uh, the National Institutes of Health, and uh, that's a public organization, of course. And since you have consumed four cups of coffee, you would remember who all your funders are. I most certainly would. I wouldn't forget one like Starbucks, I can tell you that. <laughs> That's Michael Yassa. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at the University of California at Irvine, looking at caffeine and memory at research that was initiated at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for your time and for a cup. Thank you for having me.